Agostini, Head of Climate and Energy Policies, Enel Group. Antonio Coutinho, Chief Executive Officer, EDP Innovation. Anne Mettler, Vice President, Europe, Breakthrough Energy. And Bloomberg's John Fraher. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, so last summer, the US Congress shocked the world and the climate community when it finally um, came up with what emerged as the most ambitious climate plan in US history. Uh, America finally seemed to be getting serious about the climate crisis um, and also about the threat posed to America's industrial base by China's growing dominance in the global clean energy uh, supply chain. But it also posed a very unsettling question to Europe, which for a long time had liked to paint itself as a green champion. Should it stick with its current Green Deal ideas and risk losing jobs and industry, or does it need to up its game? Um, so, Daniel, maybe I'll start with you. I mean, nine months on from IRA, there was a lot of talk about trade war that doesn't seem to doesn't seem to have panned out, and the EU seems to be looking at a policy response that marginally improves on the Green Deal roadmap. Um, we're seeing plans to accelerate things like permitting and production targets for heat pumps and solar panels and batteries, but it's very much sort of stay the course stuff. It's not really sort of a big new thing. Um, does that feel like the right response, or is the EU at risk of looking very complacent here? Um, I think it is the right response. I think we forget that the EU and the US are in very different stages of their decarbonization, of their energy transition journey. The EU is ahead in terms of stability. Uh, the course in the EU in terms of targets has been steady for a number of years. The only thing we have seen is increase in the ambition of the EU. Uh, in the US, that has been very different. Again, we have operations as ENA both in the EU and the US, but also in, in other areas of the world. And so we're, we're investing in both, in both regions. So I think when one compares these two uh, policies, one should really think that we're talking about different things. Um, the EU, at this point, the main challenge of the EU is not so much economic, it's, it's a challenge of the framework, a regulatory framework, how you get acceptability in local communities, uh, infrastructure. So in that sense, that's where the EU should be focusing on. Uh, the program that has been mobilized, uh, I think there's, um, I mean, I'm aware that uh, some of the interpretations also the previous presenter gave a, maybe a bit of a different picture, but if you look at some of the authoritative uh, papers then also by Bruegel, they see quite an equivalent between the two packages in terms of the volumes. Mm -hmm. Where we really see the difference is the intensity of the incentives in the US. They're definitely a lot more generous and it's gonna be very interesting to see that. But the US needs that because they are further behind. Right. They need to convince investors that there is a will to go forward. So at the moment, um, we see them as a, as a good response based on the fact that uh, there are different parts of their journey. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to bring you in on this. I mean, we'll talk a little later about clean tech. You, of course, work for um, Breakthrough Energy, which is you know, one built, packed by, founded by Bill Gates and one of the world's preeminent clean tech investment funds. However, in a previous life, uh, you've also worked in the European Commission. You worked on the internal strategy report for President Juncker. So you know how the European Commission thinks. Um, can you give us a sense of you know, how the EU likely saw the IRA when it was, when it was first unveiled, and how do you assess its progress to date in, in yeah, so responding to it. For yeah. me, it was actually at the time very surprising how negative uh, the EU responded because, of course, for many years we wanted the EU, uh, the US, to get in the game, and then they got in the game, and we were very, we felt very threatened. And I think um, one of the mistakes that the EU made, it didn't understand sort of what was really the the very essence of um, of IRA. Um, because we think of it as subsidies, but in reality, it's an investment program. And this is ultimately what then became very threatening because a lot of European companies were thinking about investing in the United States. And I think what we didn't understand is just the attractiveness was really, it was built around positive incentives, the IRA, whereas in Europe, we oftentimes believe more in sticks, right? Um, the European uh, green policies have not been built around really encouraging investments. I would also argue that the IRA really speaks to business. 
in a way that very few EU programs have done, correct me if I'm wrong. So I think what was really important at that point, that the EU really get what, this, what made this so threatening is because it was going to move investment, it spoke to business, and it really sort of got the US in the game, in the game, in a, in a, in a very accelerated mm -hmm. manner. And then, um, and this is maybe where I disagree a little bit, I think that the response was a little subdued and confused because, I mean, simply there were two minutes. There's the Green Deal Industrial Plan. There's the Net Zero Industry Act. There's the Critical uh, Minerals uh, Act, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Critical Raw Materials Act. Not even I can follow all this. There is the, energy, <laughs> the electricity market design reform. <clears throat> all launched on the same day. And I, I, I often joke in Brussels, sort of give me the elevator pitch what this is about. <laughs> and it would be very difficult uh, to do. So I think we needed a couple of really hard hitting uh, incentives uh, that would be able to counter the US. Because of course, the additional challenge that Europe has is also a comparatively high price of energy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we needed something really hard hitting. So I say the response initially, maybe it's a good start, but we're not quite there yet. And just, I mean, we'll come back to the, again the clean tech part later. But what, you know, over the last nine months, especially towards the end of last year, there was a lot of noise from European companies, both big ones like VW and also smaller companies like you know Climeworks or whatever, saying, mm -hmm. "Look, we're really going to have to think about moving some of our operations to the U.S. because the incentives are just too good." Is that still has that petered out a little bit, or I mean, how worried are you that that will become a reality? I, honestly, I am not worried because the fact is that the transatlantic marketplace is already a very dynamic place. And just because a European company invests in the U.S. doesn't mean it ceases to be uh, a European company. I mean, you will be able to confirm that. So I think some of that is exaggerated. In fact, I would argue now would be the time that Europe and the United States should be talking about sort of a um, transatlantic clean marketplace mm. uh, where we would really look to align at an early stage of these uh, development of some of these technologies, how we can work together. I mean, the previous session was about the Brussels effect. Does it make sense for Brussels to have one definition of what is green hydrogen and the US another one? Mm. I would argue no. And I say it as someone who used to work in digital technologies, where I saw the US go one way and Europe another way. And frankly, it was very detrimental, particularly to Europe. We must make sure that this doesn't happen again in clean technologies. Mm. Antonio, do you share that? I mean, well, do you, I presume you would share the hope that we would get this transatlantic sort of clean tech accord or whatever you want to call it, but do you think that's likely? Like, tensions seem to have abated a little bit over the last nine months between the EU and the US over clean tech policy, but how worried are you that they could resurface? I'm kind of in the middle yeah. uh, on the positions. <laughs> uh, you know, on the U.S. side, I think it was, as usual, a very pragmatic approach to, the, to climate uh, mm -hmm. policy. So if you cannot enact a, a comprehensive climate policy, you just go through a, um, a climate uh, investment-driven policy, and, and that, that does the trick. On Europe, we tend to look things to a more kind of comprehensive things that goes from um, the industry side to the market design side to even labor and and so it's a more long term kind of uh, sustainable approach to this is the end game of the net zero so you know encouraging the two ways talking with each other and looking into the short term and the long term I think that's that's the right way to 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 have a, a more balanced approach mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, the majority of these investments are long-term lived. Right. So, so you better have a good understanding about uh, what to do. But I think we need to you know, go a little bit back and, and, and try to get a real perspective on what we are talking about. So last year, the world invested 1.5 trillion on clean tech, on, clean, te uh, on uh, clean investments. Which was also the first time it matched the amount of money put into fossil fuels. That's, right? that's the that's, optimistic. That, yeah. that was a big change, yeah. OK? And it was a 30% increase from the previous year. But if you go to all the roadmaps, all, all uh, you know, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, IEA, and so on, they are all saying 
that we need between 3.5 to 5 trillion a year until 2050. So we need to take that in perspective and see in a 140 trillion economy. So it's, it's massive. It's really massive. And there will be a lot of competition, not just between geographies, but also between industries. So we were talking about um, tech. We were talking, we need to talk about defense, uh, healthcare. You know, we are going to compete for um, materials, for labor, all these things to make, to make uh, the, the green transition a reality. That's a challenge. So I think we've laid the table here for the, for the sort of frame the debate. Um, and I think this is a good point, a good point in the conversation to raise our poll. So we have a poll for everyone in, you, the, in the audience to, to respond to um, on your phones. Um, the question, which I think should be popping up um, on the screen, um, goes as follows. The hundreds of billions of dollars in new EU and EU, US and EU green subsidies will A, make a meaningful dent in global carbon emissions, B, be too late to stop us breaching the Paris targets of maximum target of two degrees of warming, or C, end up proving to be a waste of taxpayers' money. So, so far as 50-50, we'll see. I'm going to turn to Anne while the numbers sort of settle, um, settle out. Um, so we've talked a lot about the nitty gritties of, of, of policy here, but of course, there is a huge, you know, there's a very exciting part of this as well. I mean, the tech part of this, the new clean technologies uh, that are coming onto the scene um, are, you know, we talk about a gold rush in the title of this, of this panel, and this really is um, a gold rush. The new edition of the Bloomer Green magazine is all about this, and you can see a lot of our coverage on the Bloomer Green website, so I encourage you all to take a look. But, you know, the U.S. obviously is always seen as the, as the, the melting pot of innovation, uh, all the, where all the exciting things happen. In Europe, what do you see um, with your sort of breakthrough, breakthrough energy um, hat on mm -hmm. as the sort of the most interesting areas where things are happening? Well, in, in general, and if you look uh, sort of across the innovation cycle, Europe always tends to do quite well in the early stages. Uh, so the R&D right. and sort of um, early deployment. And this is where I would look um, from the perspective of uh, breakthrough energy, where I can tell you a lot is happening. Um, and uh, the clean energy transition really also plays to Europe's strength, uh, which is we have really good universities. We have expertise in deep tech, in industry, process innovation that's not so easy to replicate. So there are amazing uh, projects going on at universities. We need to help them to spin out. Um, where there's also amazing companies here. We've invested in companies and we're looking very carefully across Europe and there's lots of opportunities. So early stages of innovation cycle, very promising. <laughs> The challenge in Europe has always been the scaling up and commercialization. Mm -hmm. That's a different, uh, um, a different topic. Not sure we can get into it. Um, but the other area I would say is we have a great energy technology companies in Europe that are very well established. And I would still say that this is where we have a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis the US because, of course, we didn't start thinking about clean tech since yesterday. I mean, Europe, um, in, in the early days, solar and wind was uh, stood up in Europe, right? I mean, this is uh, important to remember. We've been thinking about these issues. We've been working on these issues for a long time. And your companies are some of that product. Right? I mean, there, is, there are unbelievably good companies, sizable, established companies in Europe, also energy technology companies. So I would say where Europe can play is sort of in the established companies that are now also looking to invest in, uh, in, in the US um, and sort of the early stages. What Europe really needs to focus on is, as I said, the scaling up, the commercialization. A lot of that has nothing to do with technology. It's much more about the market dynamics, uh, the lack, I mean, what, what, what hampers Europe is the lack of a coherent single market. Mm. It continues to be very difficult. And of course, in today's dynamic, and I assume you will speak about China later, yeah. um, that you know, market size is really important, which is why I'm arguing for this transatlantic approach to clean technologies, because the fact is both Europe and the US are behind <laughs> China in some of these areas. So it makes a lot of strategic sense for us to come together and to really accelerate the, the development of these uh, technologies and yep. also the deployment of these technologies. So it sounds like you are worried about a brain drain, that the, uh, the IRA will accelerate a brain drain 
from Europe Pot to the US. Potentially, yeah. but what I can tell you is the Europeans, and I spend a lot of time with startups and with people who work in labs, they're in it with their heart, and they also want to live in Europe. You don't just go to the U.S. because there's an incentive, right? I mean, yeah. as I said, we have decades of experience here, and some of these entrepreneurs that I meet, I mean, they're nothing short of inspirational. They want to be here. They mm -hmm. want their mm -hmm. companies to succeed here. So we must do everything we can to help them thrive here in collaboration with others. But honestly, I don't, uh, I wouldn't in the short term expect a huge brain drain because you don't just live in a place for incentives. I mean, Europeans choose to live here for a variety of reasons, yeah. not just incentives. So we have our poll results. Uh, it looks like it was a polarizing question, so it almost split <laughs> down the middle, 50-50, but it will make a meaningful dent and will be, will be too late. Um, so I think what we're going to have to do at the end of the panel, the very last question, we're going to have to be the tiebreakers. So um, think about what your answer to that question is, and we'll see if you can break, um, uh, break, the, break the deadlock. Um, uh, Daniel, actually, I'd like to pick up on that point about new technologies um, in Europe. You're a big Italian and global um, utility, um, but you, know, you head energy and climate policy there. What do you see as those interesting clean tech innovation strategies companies emerging in Europe? Well, I think uh, innovation will come where you less expect it. There's, mm -hmm. there's a big uh, you know, focus on, on hydrogen, Hydrogen is a fairly established technology. If you look at it, and you know we're having real challenges in the transport, which again is just pretty uh, consolidated, and in finding the space to do renewables. Uh, there's a big hype on CCS, which has been around for a number of years. They're both technologies that are very exposed to a very high risk of stranded asset. I think it will be more interesting to look at the more, on one hand, and the more disruptive technologies. I'm thinking 3D printing, which could completely change the way we manufacture our goods and the energy intensity of that process. But not only the energy intensity, because I think one of the things that we're missing out here is that we see an acceleration because there's a perfect storm building up. It's not only climate that's going to drive all that money that we need and that acceleration. It's going to be other drivers. In Europe, this year, we went from an average in the last five years of 27 gigawatts per year to 53 plus 60 percent. Why? Not because of climate, but because of energy security. China, if you look at why China is installing all those renewables, is it about climate? No, it's about energy security mm -hmm. and it's about air quality. Air quality, big driver in China. Same thing if you look at countries like South America, Chile. So I'm saying that when we look at innovation, we have to look at a multi-dimension matrix. The <coughs> next big challenge, and it's emerging in Europe, is air quality. Air quality mm -hmm. strikes uh, a heart, at the heart of urban dwellers. And the air quality in European cities is really dismal. And so when we look at innovation, we have to look at it multidimensional. Going back to your question, I think it's going to be the marginal innovation, the work that we're doing on batteries. Uh, we thought cobalt was the only way of mm -hmm. getting good batteries. Today, we know that is different. So that's what I call marginal. You're looking at improving a technology. And then the more disruptive one, especially we still are not exploiting enough the intersection between the energy transition and the digital world. Uh, how do we get behavioral change in a meaningful way? Again, we've seen a lot of behavioral change this year in Europe because people were motivated in the right way. We've run some simulations on our decarbon decarbonization pathways projects in Enel. And if you change the model of transport, putting more pooling of resources, more intelligent transport in there, it can reduce emissions drastically. So I think we have to keep more an eye on these technologies that don't require a huge investment, but they require more creativity. And I think that's where in the States, we had, they have a competitive edge in market creativity, in business models, in models that are ready to fail. A startup in the US is always ready to fail. You're not a successful entrepreneur mm. until you have failed five or six times. In Europe, no, we are a lot more sort of focused on we need to get it right, and mm. even if it takes us 10 years, but we want to get it right. So let's look at more at that universe of small innovation rather than focusing on these big silver bullets that uh, may not solve the problem but may create the risk of stranded assets. And that's how in Enel, for instance, we looked in CCS, 
We give it up 10 years ago and mm -hmm. we don't regret it. Uh, other technologies like that, they're just, the risk is too strong for uh, stranded assets. Very, very quickly, because I want to talk about China, but so, no, five just, seconds. Just, yeah, 10 seconds. Just, <laughs> just, just to add to this, you know, 70% uh, of the emissions are covered by 15 technologies. You know, it's, it's from the, a report from McKinsey. And I think it shows that this is not a technology problem at the end of the day. So it's a, it's a problem of innovation, but not a problem of technology. And we tend to, to uh, uh, equal innovation with technology, which not, is not the case. It's, it's a lot about you know, changing the way we consume energy. Because electricity only represents 21% of the global energy consumption. So if we put all renewables, uh, if we decarbonize all electricity, it's go only going to be 20% of the emissions. So we need to electrify the economy. And, and to electrify the economy, we talked about yesterday, aviation, mobility, and so on. But uh, uh, heat, industrial heat, you know, it's, it's a big change. And we need a lot of innovation on bringing up customers to change the way they consume energy. So, and, and also on, on the labor side, sorry. So we have three minutes left. I really want to talk about China very quickly. So uh, um, the columnist Adam Tu, an economist, Adam Tu wrote in a column recently that when we talk about EU and US, the differences in EU and US climate policy, we're talking about the vanity of small differences, when like really the big thing we should be talking about is China. I mean, in many ways, IRA and the Green Deal, they are also part of an industrial policy to contain China and to sort of push back China's dominance of the green tech supply chain. But when you look at the numbers, when you look at just how much of the supply chain for batteries, for solar, for, you know, for cars, um, comes from China, I guess the question I'd ask you, Anne, I mean, is the battle already lost? It cannot be lost. Um, and um, I would say that uh, we are at least now wrapping our minds around what needs to be done. I know that people look at the production targets, both in the US and in Europe, with great skepticism. However, you know, in Europe, there is a vibrant debate about strategic autonomy. You cannot be strategic, you know, uh, exercise strategic autonomy if 90% of your solar panels, 70% of your wind turbines, almost, you know, a large chunk of your batteries come from a single country that is so clearly not in our sphere of influence. So what I would say is that uh, if I was still advising the, uh, the president of the European Commission, I would say there are certain basics. Uh, Europe is a resource poor geography, period, right? So I think we really need energy efficiency on an industrial scale. We need substitution. You spoke about there is the ability to build um, uh, batteries without cobalt, without a lot of rare earths. And this is happening in Europe right now. I know the companies who produce them. But we need to scale, commercialize. We need mm -hmm. to build new markets. You know, um, uh, um, a circular economy, recycling, all of that needs to be done now at an industrial scale, as well as substitution. If I had one piece of advice to the people who manage R&D budgets, it's look at substitutions. We are too dependent on these critical minerals from areas where, frankly, we don't want to be engaged in. So we really need a completely new approach, process innovation, looking at new materials. So there's also lots of opportunity here, I have to say, and by no means is it lost. But I do think Europe and the US, to a very large extent, are in the same boat, mm -hmm. which is why we need to talk across the Atlantic about these issues. Danielle, Antonio, do you want to get in on, on a final thought on that? I mean, you both, you're both you know, part of and run chunks of big utilities in Europe. How much do you worry that the, the solar panels and the wind turbines and all of the minerals going into the products that power your energy are coming from China? Is that something you actively think and worry about? I mean, you need to, to think about uh, the resilience of supply chains. At the end of the day, if you need to do make investments and so on, you need to, to, to make sure that you have the goods to, to deliver. And, and, and I think that the, the current time shows that it, it's difficult. But at the end of the day, the question is global. Mm -hmm. And it's better that the three blocks try to work together in a way to, to deliver the, um, the targets mm -hmm. that are challenging to yeah. mankind. I, I would agree. I think it's an issue of diversification. Obviously, this, has, this crisis has shown us how diversifying your supply is important. That obviously has a bit of an impact on the mm -hmm. economies of scale, on, on procurement, because 
uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, we'll find the balance and uh, you know, we're not worried, we're looking into it. Okay. And now, as I said, the very final thing, we need, to, we need to be the tiebreakers on the poll question that I asked, so I'll repeat the question very quickly. Hundreds of billions of dollars in new US and EU green subsidies will A, make a meaningful dent in global emissions, B, are too late uh, to stop us breaching the Paris targets, or C, end up proving to be a waste of taxpayers' money. I think they're a, catalyzer, and it's one. So they will make a dent because it's a catalyzer. Okay. It's going to activate a process. I agree that it's a catal catalyzer, and I think we over, uh, underestimate what can be done in 10 years. I um, agree. A, definitely, uh, because we are still strong in innovation, and if we bring these innovations into the world, we will cut global carbon emissions. Optimism wins. Um, so we are. Thank you so much.